Thank you. All right, can everyone hear me in the back? Looks pretty good. So let, I'm going to tell Sarah a secret about mentorship. Mentorship is successful when you learn as much from the people that you're mentoring as they learn from you. And as you move through the career, I think, uh, your career, I think you'll experience that. And that's certainly been, been true with, with Sarah and a number of other people that I've had the privilege of knowing for a number of years. So I'm going to spend the time in my talk today um, talking about my perspective on the neuroscience of addictions. I think it's fair to say I have a slightly different perspective on the neurobiological processes that underlie addictive behaviors because the majority of the field, I think the, the large majority of the field, focuses on the neural mechanisms by, on which drugs act to produce reinforcement and reward, um, to attract behavior, um, to support a continuing pattern of drug pursuit and consumption, basically focusing on why our brains like to experience drugs and alcohol, why they seek them out, why they consume them. I am in the minority in that I've spent the majority of my career asking the opposite question, or a different look at this question, and that is um, why, despite the rewarding, reinforcing properties of drug and alcohol, um, there are some people who don't consume them, and amongst those people who consume them, the majority of people are able to constrain their behavior to remain subclinical, not to reach a clinically impairing pattern of drug and alcohol use. And so I, the mechanisms that are responsible that I'm going to focus on today are referred to in the field as inhibitory control. Basically, they're the mechanisms by which you, you interrupt your reward-seeking behaviors, by which you terminate um, and delimit them. And so that's what we're going to talk about. So in order to give you a, um, a window into the questions that I'm interested in, um, you can use a sort of a, a little bit more colloquial terminology to talk about these processes rather than talking about a psychological phenomena like inhibitory <coughs> control. So you can describe um, drug use, drug and alcohol abuse from two perspectives. You could talk about them from the perspective of the processes that um, underlie the approach to the seeking and taking of drugs and alcohol. Drug and alcohol seeking and taking can be referred to as, as impulsive behaviors that are under the control of motivational urges or impulses that drive us towards these stimuli. People like drugs and alcohol, they feel the desire for them, and these represent these motivational drives or impulses that lead them to engage in impulsive drug seeking and taking. Right? This isn't always, um, these are behaviors don't you know, pervade our, um, our life patterns because we compartmentalize our drug and alcohol beha taking behavior. We do them when we think they're appropriate. We constrain them at other time because individuals, uh, individuals can effortfully inhibit or interrupt um, the urges that guide them towards drug and alcohol. Right? Some people have a trait-like tendency to sort of uh, see that their impulses overwhelm their inhibition or their, interu their uh, reward interrupting behavior. Some people, by and large, under the same circumstances, the same set of motivational urges, are more likely to give in to those urges than others. They're more likely to not express inhibition or interruption of those behaviors. We refer to those people as impulsive or having impulsivity. This basically reflects this trait like proclivity to engage in impulsive behaviors. Okay? And these people probably end up being described as impulsive because either their motivational urges that guide them to drugs and alcohol are unusually strong, or as I'll focus on in this talk, the processes, the neural processes that give rise to the psychological processes by which we effect, effectuate impulse control or inhibitory impulse control are relatively weak. Right? And so what I'm going to spend most of my time talking about um, stems from the idea that there are naturally occurring um, individual differences in the strength of this inhibitory control muscle, and it ends up playing out or manifesting itself in differences in impulsivity, and impulsivity represents one gateway by which people are more likely to give in to motivational urges to dr use drug and alcohol, and more likely, therefore, um, transition to a more clinically impairing, problematic pattern of drug and alcohol use. Right. So I could start my description of inhibitory control by showing you this picture. Um, everybody knows this experiment, loose in, in quotes, not really an experiment, 
It was actually just kind of a folk psychology demonstration. Right, so this is, an, this is a, a, a test that was conducted for the first time in the early 70s at Stanford by Walter Michel. Um, it's a procedure in which you basically contrast these two processes, motivational urgency and self-control. Children are presented with um, a stimulus that they like, like a marshmallow. It could be any kind of palatable um, candy, food item, toy that they're interested in. And they are presented with a very simple problem. They're told, you can either eat this one marshmallow now, or you can wait five minutes and I'll double it. You can have two. Right? And so a procedure like this um, basically shows two patterns of behavior. Some children give in immediately. They accept one marshmallow now. Some children wait. They wait the five minutes and they are able to optimize their reward. They actually get more by waiting and they have to exert self-control to do that. But the procedure basically optimizes these two components. Right? So there's a motiv motivational urgency to consume the stimulus, but there's a break. There's a self-control, inhibitory control mechanism that tries to interrupt this reward process. And this is a simple demonstration of this dichotomy in the dichotomous behavior. Some children give in, some children wait. Right? This is a very interesting um, procedure because it demonstrates, um, um, first up, this, this dichotomous set of outcomes that reflect differences in self-control behavior. But it also tells us about gaps in the research literature. So I started out by saying a lot of literature tells us why things in our environment evoke hedonic responses, why we find drugs and alcohol reinforcing and rewarding, why we approach and consume them, and we know almost nothing about the stop mechanisms, the resist, the self-control circuitry that actually allows the kids who wait to successfully inhibit their, um, their uh, reward-seeking behavior. And I would argue that that gap in the literature is severe because it impacts our ability to understand how people control their drug and alcohol use effectively. So self-control abilities, inhibitory self-control abilities, are trait-like. That's actually why that experiment was done way back in the day in children. They were interested in being able to dichotomize self-control abilities early in life, and they wanted to demonstrate later prediction, right? Later prediction of behavior that was reflected by that dichotomization of behavior early in life. And in fact, it is trait-like. Children who give in to their urges and, seek and, and consume the marshmallow immediately rather than waiting show a different set of trajectories that will unfold over many decades henceforth. So in other words, um, their self-control abilities early in life really are, reflect a stable. Stable doesn't mean immutable, and we'll come back to this probably in the questions at the very end. But it reflects a, 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 a relatively stable characteristic of an individual which will manifest across the lifespan. And as I said, um, we know uh, that there's a strong descriptive relationship between self-control capacities and addictive behaviors. And we know it is empirically true as well because individual differences and the tendency to give in versus resist in this test tends to be strongly associated with a whole pattern of high-risk behaviors that will unfold over the next several decades, including heightened risk for initiating any chemical use, a tendency to engage in a more risky pattern of use when drug and alcohol use is, in, is in, initiated, for example, binge drinking versus low-grade drinking, um, a higher tendency to transition to a more compulsive pattern of use, meaning that the, the, the drug, use behavior, drug or alcohol use behavior is increasingly out of the control of the individual, Six, um, attempts at suppression, cutting down, reducing intake, fail, right? and ultimately to fewer successful quit attempts. People who exhibit poor self-control entering into treatment are more likely um, to fail that treatment. All things being equal, they do. It is trait-like. I, as I, I, I open the door by saying it's not immutable. There's a, a, there, is no, um, there is no sure, um, empirically supported intervention. 
that alters this in, um, capacity in people. It is being studied. There's a number of studies, um, whether you're talking about actually training young people on inhibitory control um, or um, pharmacological or uh, other kinds of environmental influences that may alter it. It's an area of active investigation, but there is no um, data that de definitively indicates that there's any one of these interventions that are successful. And maybe at the end we'll talk about um, the pros and cons of using that kind of an approach to try to modulate behavior in young people. Um, if any of you have small children and you watch Sesame Street, you know that Sesame Street has had an ongoing program over the past three years to, uh, uh, refer, um, to talk about what they call self-regulation. And so Ch Cookie Monster is our prototypic discontrolled, disinhibited, poor inhibitory control characteristic. And, and Cookie Monster appears in a number of episodes over the past few years that are focused on self-regulation, that involve kind of mindfulness type um, terminology, um, stopping, being in the moment, thinking about reflection as opposed to reflexive action. Um, and so there's, there's thinking about this. It's an area of discussion, but there is no sure and fast, clear method for manipulating this ability. It isn't just true that poor self-control measured earlier in life elevates your risk um, for drug and alcohol abuse. In fact, it's associated with higher propensity to engage in a series of high-risk behaviors, including overeating um, children who gave in versus who resist end up with higher body mass indexes in later in life. And as I said, other kinds of, of impulsive risk-taking behaviors also segregate with this trait. So it's not specific to drug and alcohol use. Rather, the drug and alcohol use represents one of the manifestations of, of a relatively poor inhibitory control abilities. But we want to be able to capture this phenotype because if we're going to study it neurobiologically, we need to be able to measure this phenomena in the laboratory. Ideally, we would be able to transform the dichotomous self-control variable into a more quantitative one because people don't have or have not self-control. They lie on a continuum of effectiveness. And we also want to use procedures that are translational so that we can interrogate neurobiology and genetics in multiple species using tests that measure the same underlying capacity, right? Because we're not going to learn very much if this is our only subject and this is our only procedure for measuring this capacity. So in our laboratory, we do this using a translational um, discrimination learning and reversal test. Basically, across species, the concept of this test is very simple. We train a reward-seeking response, right? So in a test like this, you look at a, a screen where multiple stimuli are present, um, and subjects interact with these stimuli. The mouse nose pokes the stimulus. The monkey touches the stimulus. The person touches the stimulus. And based upon their interaction with these stimuli, they gain access to reinforcement, right? So in this case, if the mouse touches, nose pokes on the star, it's going to get a palatable food. If it nose pokes on the grid, it gets nothing, right? Similar kind of scenario here and here. And if you offer subjects the opportunity to do this across training, they progressively figure out the rule that the star is associated with reinforcement. I like reinforcement. I should touch the star, right? This is a simple reinforcement learning procedure in which you train one discriminated response, right? And across trials, subjects get more and more accurate and faster at interacting with this stimulus because reinforcement shapes their behavior. This is, uh, this is very simple. Okay. What's not so simple about this task is that once the response is well-trained, at a point in time unexpected to the subject, the reinforcement contingencies change. I stop reinforcing an interaction with star. Now you have to interact with grid in order to obtain reinforcement. Okay. You could do this in mice. You could do this in monkeys. You could do this in people. And when you do this, subjects perseverate. They continue to return to the originally trained stimulus. Right? And individuals exhibit individual differences in how rapidly they can sever that response, interrupt that response, so that they can change their behavior. Subjects that are more impulsive perseverate longer. They get stuck tr um, responding to the originally trained stimulus longer because that reinforcement rule has control over their responding. So this is a measure that we're going to use across species. I'm going to talk about a number of species in my talk.
in which we can associate, we can measure inhibitory control at, uh, across species and in a quantitative way, because not present or absent, you can perseverate a little, a medium amount, or a lot. Okay? If you use tests like this in human subjects with and without um, a stimulant use disorder, a drug addiction, you find what's predicted. For example, if you compare um, the data point, the green data point here in healthy subjects to the green data point here in stimulant, um, drug, use, um, stimulant drug users, um, there's a substantially greater difficulty in the group with the substance abuse problem with updating their behavior. They perseverate longer because their circuitry in their brain that they use to successfully suppress that reward-seeking re response and change it has been negatively affected. Okay? So across species, you can use this procedure to measure this inhibitory controllability. And it is, in fact, I'm just showing you the data now, it is associated with, it's a sensitive measure of the self-control problems you find in people with a drug use disorder. Not only is, um, can you use this test across species, it, it's based upon the ba same basic underlying neurobiology. The same neural circuits in humans and mice are required for this self-controllability. We know from uh, uh, human fMRI studies, we conducted a, an fMRI study in otherwise normal human volunteers that showed that the first successful ability to suppress the response post-change, the first point in the task where the subjects say, I should stop responding to this stimulus and change my behavior is associated with activation of a region of the lateral orbitofrontal cortex and its regions, its associated target regions in the dorsomedial striatum. Okay. And from study, lesion studies in monkeys and mice, we know that these brain regions are necessary. If you lesion the lateral orbitofrontal cortex and the dorsomedial striatum, you convert a healthy subject who can readily exert self-control into one who cannot. They're stuck for a much longer period of time on that trained response. So across species, there's a high degree of conservation at the neural circuit level in terms of how we successfully inhibit our reward-seeking behaviors. And I could give you a whole talk about that. But what I'm going to predominantly focus on, or entirely almost, through the rest of this talk, is that individuals, individual people, individual monkeys, individual mice, differ in their self-control capacities. I think it's actually fair to say most of us, many of us have the uh, impression that people vary substantially in their self-control capacity. It's a highly individual, individually variable characteristic, right? And that these individual differences in inhibitory control explain a number of things. They explain why some people initiate drug use, drug and alcohol use, and others don't. But more importantly, they probably explain why of all the people who use drug and alcohol, but fairly common phenotypes in our population, only a minority show a pattern of drug and alcohol use which escapes their control, where they try to stop and they fail to. Because the majority of people who use drugs and alcohol, and I make no discrimination between the different kinds of drugs, opiates, stimulants, um, nicotine, the majority of people who initiate um, use of those drugs will successfully quit, right? abstain, and survive. They do not have a clinically impairing pattern of drug use. Okay? Only a minority exhibit this phenotype, this discontrolled pattern of use. So I want to connect the dots between heritable variation in this, in this intrinsic psychological um, function and its underlying neurobiology and propensity to develop a more problematic pattern of drug use. And I want to understand the biological sources of this individual variation. What are the actual things that make one person uh, have greater self-control than another? So to do this, I'm going to use a systems genetics approach. Right? Systems genetics reflects the fact that uh, in, in most behavior genetics research, we've got a behavioral process up here, some phenotype. Could be a disease, like having addictions or not. We have DNA variation down here at the molecular level. We can detect statistical associations between these two levels, we can say this gene, this allele is correlated with propensity to develop an addiction. But ultimately, to understand that relationship, we have to figure out the intervening biological levels through which genotype comes to func affect physiological function at a cellular and circuitry level in order to ultimately give rise 
what we call endophenotypes, right? Indicators of elevated risk for development of the disease and ultimately the disease. And so what we're going to try to do in the next 20 minutes or so is talk about how we can, use, we can use this kind of approach to map relationships between a disease process like elevated risk for addictions um, and DNA variation um, and populate intermediate levels of biology to, ex to understand this um, at, a, at a richer level that's necessary for divining interventions. So to understand my approach, you have to understand this slide, so I'll give it a little bit of time. Right? Um, in this particular approach I'm going to talk about today, we take, fat, we take advantage of the fairly large number of um, inbred mouse strains. An inbred mouse strain is a line of mice where all the individuals within that line are to the maximal extent possible genetically identical to one another because they've been bred to homozygosity at all alleles and therefore their offspring are all have the same set of homozygous alleles that the parents have. Okay. Each mouse from each of the hundreds of different kinds of common inbred and recombinant inbred strains that are available to us are genetically distinct from one another because they were created from different sets of ancestors or intercrosses, but all the individuals within each strain are genetic duplicates of one another. Each strain is like a different person. It has its own unique genotype and its own unique phenotype as a consequence of those genetics. They differ from people and that each strain is like an unending, indefinite um, series of monozygotic twins of the same person, right? So instead of having, we have, you know, 100-something people in this room, just like each of the 100 strains, but imagine there was an unending li li number of clones of each of you that could be evaluated over time. And that even 100 years from now, the clone would be identical to you today, because you have a stable genome. This is a very important aspect of this study because it allows us to map relationships between where genotype differ between strains and there's an associated phenotype consequence, like differences in self-control ability. And we can understand intermediate levels of biology because we can basically study the same mouse an infinite number of times. Every time I call the company and I order a mouse with a particular designation, it's genetically the same subject. So I can study it for one phenotype today, and I can decide tomorrow I need to study the same subject for gene expression, and tomorrow I need to study it for its levels of dopamine receptors, and I can accumulate information about the biology intermediate between DNA variation and behavior because I can study the same subject over and over and over again. Right? So what we're going to talk about are studies in which we have variation in a, we'll call it a clinical trait of interest. It could be propensity to engage in an addictive behavior. We're going to map relationships between that and the level at the, um, at, between variation at the DNA level. And then we're going to try to use information about gene expression, protein function in the brain, and behavioral endophenotypes like impulse control, which are not synonymous with addictions but represent the, one of the final common pathways to the expression of addiction to, to populate a full multi-level biology that explains these relationships. So to do this, I need to be able to measure um, individual differences in self-control capacity in inbred mice, and we do it in a way not unlike what I showed you earlier. In this case, they don't learn uh, uh, relationships between a stimulus and a reward. They learn relationships between an op uh, a particular behavior and reward. These mice have multiple response options. I can press a lever here or here or here. I train the mouse in this case that pressing this lever is what's going to trigger a reward. Over time, it learns a reinforcement rule, it returns that lever and presses it with alacrity, so it gains access to reinforcement. And then at some point I change the rule, and when I change the rule, this is called again the reversal condition, they have to change or inhibit that conditioned response, and it reflects this individual difference um, in self-control capacity. So I told you earlier, this, uh, this uh, process depends upon um, very similar neural mechanisms in, in mouse brain, monkey brain, rat brain, human brain. So this is a complicated slide. What you have on the x-axis are 101 um, uh, distinct inbred mouse strains, all of which were evaluated using this test. Okay? And I'm plotting their phenotype on the y-axis. 
These are different genotypes down here. This is their individual, this is their strain level of self-control capacity. And what you see is that there's quantitative variation in this ability across the panel. There's some, don't pay attention to this number, this is a log scale, so these are actually very large differences in phenotype. Some mice are really, really good at stopping, inhibiting, updating their behavior. When the rule changes, they can really rapidly respond to that. And others that persevere for hundreds and hundreds of more trials than those subjects do. They're stuck with this originally trained response and everything in between. Right? This is a substantially heritable trait. I can calculate the heritability of the trait. Heritability meaning the proportion of phenotypic variance which is attributable to genetics by um, looking at the amount of phenotypic variability accounted for by genotype, and it's about a third. About a third of the phenotypic variance is attributable to genetic factors. That number doesn't surprise anybody in behavior genetics because just about every behavioral ph uh, phenomena in animals and people have this kind of moderate heritability, one third um, to about a half of the phenotypic variance being attributable to genetics. Okay? So we have a heritable trait which is potentially suitable um, for um, underlying mechanistic molecular genetic studies. I told you that across species, um, the same brain regions are involved in the task. There's this recruitment of the same ba basic brain structures across species. But that's not the same thing as saying the same molecules or the same molecular mechanisms are responsible across species. So this is one of the things that's possible to do because of the stable genome of these different strains. I had studied, or my graduate student and I studied, um, the reversal learning self-control phenotype across this panel of strains. 20 years earlier, a laboratory in Pennsylvania had studied um, different aspects of dopaminergic transmission in the same strains of mice, right? Not the same mice, obviously, because 20 years separated the time of our research. But we studied the same genotypes because their genome is stable. So any two phenotypes which are configured, which are influenced by the same genes, will co-vary across the population. Right? If one gene gives rise to two traits, which is pleiotropy, then across the population, the two traits should always systematically co-vary because if you inherit this allele, you're up on both. If you inherit this allele, you're down on both. Right? This is called a genetic correlation where a trait, where two traits co-vary in a population because they're under the master control of the same genetics, right? You could do something for environmental correlation where two traits are responsive to the same perturbations. But here we're talking about genetic correlation. And what we found when we looked at our panel, and I'll tell you why this is interesting in the next slide, what we found when we looked across our panel was that we could um, we could explain with a high degree of fidelity their individual self-control abilities by knowing the state of dopaminergic transmission in their brain, and specifically the density of D2 type dopamine receptors in their brain in multiple brain regions. It turned out it didn't matter what brain region you looked at. And the relationship was this. Those strains which are genetically programmed to express few dopamine receptors have the poorest self-control, and mouse strains that are genetically programmed to express the highest numbers of D2 receptors have the best inhibitory control. When we found this result, we immediately knew it was significant because we already knew across every species in which it's ever been studied that this same relationship reappears over and over and over again. We had already found this relationship in non-human primates. These are monkeys where we're looking at their self-control ability in a reversal task and their brain dopamine D2 receptors, in this case measured non-invasively with positron emission tomography. Right? The same relationship holds. Those monkeys who had the fewest dopamine D2 receptors had the poorest self-control. Those who had the highest dopamine D2 receptors had the best self-control. And then in the same year, in a paper in Science, the same relationship was found in otherwise normal human subjects. People who have the fewest D2 receptors are the most impulsive. People who have the highest D2 receptors are the least impulsive. So in every species in which it's been looked at, this relationship is very strong. In fact, I would say this is one of the strongest biomarkers 
strongest and most reproducibly observed biomarkers that explains a behavioral trait that's been studied um, across species. Some factors, including genetics and non-genetic factors that program low expression of D2 receptors, configure poor self-control. So not only across species are we finding the same brain regions are involved, but the same molecules are involved across species. This tells us that we can use mouse genetics to find the mechanisms that underlie this behavior, and it's likely to be shared across a mammalian species at the very least. And I do want to take a segue to say it isn't all individual differences. It's been known for a very long time that when you compare, the, uh, when you compare individuals who have a substance use disorder and healthy controls, and you measure their levels of D2 receptor um, density, for lack of a better term for the moment, you find, and have found for decades now, that D2 receptor density in the brains of people with a substance use disorder is lower than it is in controls. By the way, exactly as you would have predicted if it was an underlying risk factor for addictions. It then ends up segregating with the phenotype, right? This has been known for a long time. But what was also shown in this paper from Edie London's lab is that individual differences in D2 receptor availability um, in um, healthy controls and methamphetamine-dependent subjects correlates with their impulsivity, exactly as we found in animals. Healthy controls and methamphetamine-dependent subjects who have the fewest dopamine receptors are the most impulsive. And what happens, what appears to happen as people transition from being healthy to health, having a drug use disorder is that the relationship actually gets stronger and stronger because drug experience further diminishes D2 receptor function and actually exaggerates the relationship between D2 receptors and impulse control. So substance use disorders are an example of an extreme of a continuum that exists across all people healthy and not. And in this extreme, the relationship is getting stronger and stronger and stronger. It's not actually true that D2 receptor availability is just a biomarker of individual differences in self-control. We think it's causal. We think it's causal because of data like this. We showed years ago that if you take otherwise healthy non-human primates and all you do is pharmacologically interfere, in this case with the function of D2 receptors, not with their expression number, we're pharmacologically blocking them, that's sufficient to produce impaired self-control. Right? So that subjects who have few receptors and are more impulsive, presumably that relationship holds because there's a deficiency in the, in the dopamine D2 receptor um, tone in brain, which we can simulate pharmacologically by interfering with these receptors. And vice versa, going back to the slide I showed you earlier, the problems with self-control that are present in people with a substance use disorder compared to controls disappear if they're treated acutely with an agonist of D3, D2 receptors, as you would predict. Right? So all of this supports that um, it's not just that D2 receptors are a biomarker for this trait. They are causing some manifestation of the trait through their uh, effects on neural circuitry. I'll talk later about what those possible neural circuits are. So the presence of genome-wide, the presence of a genetic effect on, on self-controllabilities in mice, the fact that this is a heritable trait means that you can do what amounts to a conventional genome-wide association study, a discovery study where you simply ask the question, which of all the genetic variants present in the genome statistically correlates with phenotypic variation, right? So it's a simple experiment, whether carrying allele A versus allele B actually predicts phenotypic variability. The null hypothesis is knowing whether you carry allele A versus allele B has no explanatory value. And for most SNPs in the genome, that's true, because most SNPs in most genes don't change this trait, but a subset do. Right? This is a typical statistical representation of this. This is the mouse genome. Individual colors are the individual chromosomes. Individual dots are individual SNP markers. The y-axis is a statistical evidence that supports an association between a particular SNP and the phenotype, and what you can see is that um, there are multiple um, loci in the mouse genome that carry variants that are statistically associated with this trait. This is different than other genome-wide association studies. You might see in a lecture like this that involve human subjects, because these are actual genome-wide significant loci. These are not 
moving in that direction, the difference of uh, the major power of mouse genetics is that we can I readily identify true genome-wide significant loci um, in, with relatively small sample sizes. So there are multiple genes in the mouse, there are multiple regions of the, of the mouse genome that carry variants that explain this uh, self individual variation and self-controlled capacity. I'm going to talk mostly about um, this locus on mouse chromosome 10. This locus on mouse chromosome 10, all we know from this kind of association study is that there's some SNP in and around this region of the genome which is associated with the trait. It doesn't tell us which gene is associated because the region of the gene that's statistically associated with the trait is still a very large region. The region of the gene that carries variants that are associated with this trait spans about 200 known or suspected transcripts, which is true, which is the reason that there's such a large region is because the linkage disequilibrium is extensive in this panel. Right? So we need an approach for saying which of all the genes that are present in this cute quantitative trait locus, this region of the genome that explain, explains variation of the trait, which of these genes is likely the one we should focus our attention on? There's a number of ways you can go about prioritizing genes that are likely to be the ones that are responsible and that you should direct your future study to. I'm going to tell you about a different approach later. But one common approach is to monitor the expression of all of these genes, right? So we've got about 200 um, transcripts down here that are expressed from this locus. Monitor the expression of all of those transcripts across the panel of strains and ask which genes exhibit a pattern of gene expression dosage which systematically predicts the behavioral phenotype. We're having more of the gene means you have better, the trait, wor better trait or worse trait, where there's an expression dosage genetic correlation with the phenotype. This is based upon the idea that most SNPs that are associated with a trait are regulatory, and they act through influencing gene dosage, and the DNA phenotype variant uh, association is explained through gene dosage. So we did this. We monitored the expression of all the genes through this locus across the entire panel and determined which of those genes exhibit a pattern of expression which is correlated with the trait. We wanted to rule out false positives, so we had a number of other very strict criterion for inclusion of these genes. We needed to see it in multiple brain regions, and we needed to see it in gene expression data sets that were gathered on different platforms, so we weren't studying a platform-specific effect. Um, we also wanted to only study genes whose variation and expression were under the control of SNP variants, DNA variants, that were contained within the locus of the gene, called cis-acting variants. And when you do this, there are three transcripts that meet all of our criterion, including this one, which lies right over the peak. It's actually this top SNP right here. This gene is called SYN3. This shows you the evidence. Individual strains, their phenotype, their self-control phenotype is correlated with their SYN3 expression phenotype. Um, it's a it's, the relationship is such that strains that express relatively low SYN3 expression have the poorest self-control. Strains that have the highest in three expression have the best self-control. All we knew when we, found, when we made this discovery is what SYN3 was. SYN3 uh, is a synaptic phosphoprotein. Um, the synapsins were one of the first phosphoproteins identified by Paul Greengard's lab now many years ago. Um, SYN3 belongs to a member, as a family of, of synapsins for which there are three distinct genes encoding three distinct proteins. They're neuron-specific. That's an exciting thing. That's, um, they're so neuron-specific, people, probably anybody here who does viral vector work knows, there's a good chance you use a SYN promoter in your virus to produce neural-specific expression. They're brain-specific. Okay. All neurons in the brain have one of the synapsin isoforms. Synapsins 1 and 2 are pretty boring. They're found all over the central nervous system, and they're fully redundant with one another. If you knock out one or the other, you get nothing. You knock out both you produce a major perturbation in neurotransmitter release. Okay? You get a major neuroperturbation because synapsins function to segregate vesicles away from the ready releasable pool. This means that when synapsin expression or function is high, the amount of neurotransmitter release per action potential is low, because okay? they actually functionally constrain the size of the ready releasable pool. When you have high neural activity, high frequency firing, chemkinase phosphorylate synapsins, 
synapsins are inhibited, and they release vesicles to the ready releasable pool, so you can replenish more readily. Okay? So a low synapsin expression or function condition is a high neurotransmitter release condition. As I'll tell you shortly, synapsin 3 is different than synapsins 1 or 2. It is not found everywhere in the central nervous system, and there is no redundant, there's no plan B for its expression. Synapsins are, synapsin 3 is found in a relatively discrete number of brain regions. You can go to Allen Brain Atlas and pull it up, and you can see where it's expressed in the brain. And if you are agreeably dopamine-centric like I am, you immediately notice a high density of expression in the ventral midbrain. The ventral midbrain, the ventral tegmental area and substantia nigra express very high levels of synapsin 3. Synapsin 3 is the isoform of synapsin 3 expressed in dopaminergic neurons. We know that because if you knock synapsin 3 out, you produce exactly what you'd expect. You produce dopamine neurons whose ready releasable pool contains many more vesicles. They release much more dopamine in response to action potential than does a wild type who has synapsin 3 expression. And there's no, again, there's no redundant isoform. If you only knock out synapsin 3, you fully recapitulate um, the neurochemical phenotype associated with knocking all isoforms out. This is not just true of every other monoamine system in the brainstem. This is just dopamine neurons that exhibit this characteristic. And again, this paper, well, not again, this paper came out about two months after we made the discovery when we were trying to figure out how synapsin 3 might produce this effect on self-control. And it all starts to make sense. Right? Here you have a phenotype in which there's DNA variants in this region of mouse chromosome 10. If you carry the variant that configures low synapsin 3 expression, you have a, you have a dopaminergic system that releases much more dopamine per action potential than does an a mouse who carries an allele that configures high synapsin 3 expression. D2 receptors are homeostatically decreased in the brain because you have a dopamine system which is phasically releasing more dopamine per action potential. And ultimately, the expression of the inhibitory control contrate is downstream of that sequence of neurochemical events. Low syn3 expression, high phasic dopamine, low D2 receptors, impulsive. So this is a good example of how um, you can use a genome-wide approach to make a completely novel discovery using a discovery approach. And then you can intersect it with known biology, and you found a new etiological mechanism that gives rise to the modulation of a pathway that everybody knows and agrees clearly is involved in this phenotype. So behavioral measures of impulsivity are heritable in a number of different species, not just mouse and man, but certainly mouse and man. Um, impul impulsivity is reproducibly linked. Um, to dopamine D2 receptor availability in frontal and striatal regions with low receptor availability, configuring poor impulse control, and gene variants that regulate phasic dopamine transmission are upstream of this D2-like receptor function and ultimately the expression of the behavioral trait. But we want to link this back. We want to link this heritable variation and impulse control ability back to, to addictions, right? The prediction is that subjects who have poor self-control are at greater risk for substance abuse problems, right? So we should be able to test this hypothesis in a, in, in a causal way. We should be able to test this hypothesis because I phenotyped all these inbred strains. I know which strains are, have good inhibitory control. I know which strains have bad inhibitory control. And because I can study the same strain over and over again because their genomes are stable, I can go back and acquire mice from strains that exhibit really, really good or really, really bad self-control abilities. This is just showing you that these three um, acronyms ref represent three distinct, four distinct, sorry, inbred strains, two of whom were selected for being really good at suppressing a response, um, two of which were chosen for being really poor at suppressing a response. It's not just a learning phenomenon, because they actually learn the, the initial rule equally. It's only the change part where they differ. And when you take mice from these strains, and you um, uh, give them an intravenous uh, a jugular catheter, and you put them in an operant chamber, and you say, press the button as many times as you want, each button press leading to an intravenous delivery of cocaine. Right? So this is a voluntary cocaine self-administration procedure. Take as much as you want. They, the, two, uh, the four strains differ dramatically, and they differ in exactly the predicted direction. Those strains who have 
good self-control, and the reversal test, when offered the opportunity to self-administer cocaine, do so with much less vigorousness than do the strains that have poor inhibition. So there's a genetic association in mice, just like we think is in people, between these uh, individual variation in their inhibitory control and their drug self-administration tendencies. This is an important observation, but it has a caveat. This was, as I said, an extreme groups analysis. I took subjects from the, the extremes of the tails of the self-control trait, and I mapped a difference in their cocaine self-administration behavior. That's problematic. One should always be a little bit cautious about interpreting extremes as representing the mechanisms that explain the variation across the entire population. Right? So in order to go from an extreme group approach to understanding full population variation, you have to do what is almost an insane thing to do. Um, you have to take mice from all of these individual genotypes and individually and sequentially phenotype them for self-administration of cocaine. Um, and that, once upon a time, would have been tech, many study sections would tell you this is not possible to do. Um, fortunately, we changed their mind and we did the study. This is cocaine self-administration behavior in a panel of now almost 70 um, different genotypes, 70 di di distinct um, inbred mouse strains. If you don't know um, exactly how the technique of intravenous self-administration works, you probably don't know why this is so difficult. It's just a technically extremely difficult thing to do. And if you map their tendency to self-administer cocaine across the panel, you get behavior that looks like this, right? So basically, this is how much cocaine they prefer to take um, when they can take anything from here to there, right? We're just asking them how much they choose to take, right? And when this is basically expressing their levels of intake after acquisition has been completed, when they've reached a stable level of intake. Okay. And what you see is there's remarkable phenotypic variability in the reinforcing effects of cocaine. There are a few mouse strains who reject it completely, who say, I don't want any of that. Right? There are a few mouse strains that this is actually the technical limit. There were only 65 infusions that were available in the syringe. Um, it's not that there are no error bars. It's that every mouse had the same phenotype. They all take every single dose of the drug that's available in the syringe every single day. But then in, there's the range of values in between. Right? So like people, there's individual variation in, their, in the reinforcing effect of cocaine. Everything from some subjects that don't like it. There are people who have cocaine for the first time and, and reject it, find it to be an aversive experience, unpleasant. Right? There are others that think it's the best thing that ever happened to them. And then there's a range of variability in between that brought roughly maps onto um, their alacrity for um, developing a more problematic um, pattern of repetitive cocaine use. Unlike reversal learning, the heritability of this trait is extremely high. Virtually all the variance is attributable to genetics. Almost none of the variability is attributable to any environmental factor the subject was exposed to. One quick question about this experiment. Are these male animals or male or female? This particular slide is all male subjects. Um, my laboratory, unfortunately, um, having done this once, is involved in repeating the entire experiment now with male and female subjects in 100 different genotypes. Half, um, half in a control group that self-administer saline, half a, self, a group that self-administer cocaine. Right. I, I put this up here. <laughs> this is very technically difficult. This is like four years of somebody toiling away to generate this data. But it generates the first potential insight into trying to uncover the underlying genetic relationships between these two traits. Now, just like before, I told you any two traits that are dependent upon the same genotypes will co-vary in the population because allele, we get pleiotropy. Alleles influence one trait, they influence the other. Since you only inherit one allele at each marker, these alleles dial up or dial down your phenotypic variability. And you find that across the population, the relationship persists. The strains that are, have better self-control take less drug. The, dr the strains that have poor self-control take more. So the reinforcing value of a drug of abuse like cocaine is subject to substantial heritable individual variation. Um, impulsivity is a genetically correlated endophenotype, which because it's there to begin with, that predicts um, subsequent alacrity to self-administered drugs, explaining the association. 
So one thing that people often ask is why um, inhibitory control capacity and self-administration genetically correlate across individuals. One possible idea is that they reflect the same underlying biological markers. Dopamine and D2 receptors change self-administration. Dopamine and D2 receptors affect impulsivity. Any gene that affects one affects both. There's actually evidence that this is true. If you measure impulsive behaviors or impulsivity across a large number of otherwise non-dependent, healthy people, and then you give them an, uh, an oral dose of amphetamine and measure their subjective response, there's a correlation. People that are more impulsive tell you the drug feels better. Okay? That kind of supports this idea. Another idea is that there's a relationship that's actually more fundamental, and that animals do, in fact, inhibit their drug taking. They don't inhibit their drug taking because they fear being arrested. They inhibit their drug taking because every individual has the, same, the following basic dose response curve. As you start taking the drug, the first effect is almost universally good. And it's as the dose accrued it increases that you start pushing into the aversive effects. Drugs are initially almost entirely rewarding and reinforcing. It's only when you take more that you reach the peak and you start to feel the negative effects. So another hypothesis that I prefer is that the reason these things are, are associated with one another is because mice that have poor inhibitory control feel all that good rush when they take the first five doses, and as it starts becoming aversive, they don't stop. Good inhibitory control subjects say, I've reached the point where I've had enough, I don't need any more. And these subjects don't. And that means that there's the same, the same basic prediction association between mice um, and humans. So I just want to, in like a few last minutes, um, talk about what you can do, a novel discovery that, that stems from what you can do with these results. As I said earlier, we can map statistical relationships between DNA, um, DNA variants, and our phenotype, like self-control or like um, drug self-administration. We can find statistical relationships between them. The rela statistical relationships usually implicate large regions of the genome, right, because of extensive linkage, linkage disequilibrium. And we have to have methods for figuring out which genes within those regions are likely the ones that are true. I've been collaborating for a number of years now with Gary Peltz's lab at Stanford University, who's developed this haplotype-based construction and genetic mapping technique that looks basically as genome-wide association-like approaches. He takes um, phenotype. This is drug self-administration phenotype from a panel of mice. Be it sufficient to say that some mice, some mouse lines are more related to others, to one another than others. Some are more like first cousins. Some are more like second cousins. Some are really distantly related. This represents 21 strains who represent the maximally unrelated members of the mouse lineage. So we're maximizing unrelatedness in the population. Their phenotype differs dramatically, right? And so the quest first question is, where in the genome do you find um, statistical associations between DNA and um, the phenotype? There's a major effect locus on mouse chromosome 1 that's associated with um, this phenotypic variability in this trait. I'm not showing you that here. This is just some of the genes expressed from this mouse chromosome 1 trait and the, the genetic effect that's um, associated with that gene. Of all these genes that are in this region, we chose the gene NAV1 to look in more for two reasons. The first is um, its pattern of CNS expression was um, clearer. Some of the other genes didn't exp weren't expressed at very high levels in the central nervous system. And, and that's not surprising, the NAV1 stands for neuron navigator 1 gene. It's a neuron-specific gene. The other region is because NAV1 has non-synonymous coding variants contained within it. There are variants inside this population that change the amino acid at two locations in this gene, and those two locations are thought to be functionally relevant. One of them um, is an aspartate to glutamate substitution at um, amino acid 198. Neuron navigator 1 is a developmentally regulated um, gene. During development, um, NAV1 is expressed mostly in post-mitotic, post-migratory zones, reaching a peak around P5. It localizes mainly to the branch points of growth cones. It is a growth, it's called neuron navigator 1 because it's a navigator of growth cone guidance in the central nervous system. In the adult brain, including in the mice we're studying in this self-administration study, its levels are, very, are virtually undetectable. Okay? So any effect it has happens long in time before self-administration behavior ever began. This is the pattern of SNP association 
with the trait. These are the animals that carry the glutamate um, amino acid in red. These are the, anim the strains that carry the aspartic acid amino acid in blue. And this is a, a pretty strong genetic effect. Having the glutamic acid uh, amino acid is associated with low self-administration. Having the aspartic acid um, amino acid is associated with high self-administration behavior. And you can see strains like C57 black 6J, DBA2J, that differ in this allele and differ in their phenotype. For a variety of reasons, it's important to have even better evidence to implicate this gene as functional and, and functionally associated with the trait before you proceed. Um, this just shows you the same thing, having the glutamic acid versus aspartic acid um, amino acid at this particular SNP. We want to have more and better evidence this gene is implicated in this trait. So C57 black 6J mice carry the glutamic acid version and, are high, uh, uh, and have high self-administration. Uh, DBA2J mice have the uh, uh, aspartic acid, uh, the glutamic acid version, and have low self-administration. And it turns out there's a lineage of mice that started with the cross of the Ds and the Bs, where they were the parents, and then all the children involve an intercross of the ones that have the high phenotype and the low phenotype and these two alleles. So if you look at their progeny, which are all the numbers down here represent mouse strains that, that descend from the BXD, which means B slash D cross, um, you can use them as uh, the fact that they basically recombine this locus across the population, right? There are some that carry their ancestral D and some that carry their ancestral B allele. So what I was interested in is whether across this panel of descendants of this intercross, there was variation in the level of, of NAV1 expression in the brain, and you can see that there is. There's some strains that express very low NAV1 expression, have very low NAV1 expression, some that have very high NAV1 expression, and everything in between. And their individual differences in NAV1 expression are due to SNP variants in the NAV1 locus. This is basically a genome-wide plot. Again, genomic distance on the X chromosome, statistical evidence on the Y. NAV1 expression is almost entirely under the control of SNPs within the NAV1 locus. NAV1 has variants within it that change how much of it is expressed, okay? That's supportive of the, of the basic pattern of results we've had so far. So I knew that across this panel there were differences in NAV1 expression. I knew across this panel of children from the BD intercross that there was a genetic effect in this locus that changed um, NAV1 expression. So I did a, a, a hypothesis-free thing. I went to a database called GeneNetwork.org where every piece of information that's ever been learned about these mice is aggregated in one web page. And I asked GeneNetwork.org, take NAV1 expression in the brain and tell me, all, tell me the top 10 traits, the top 10 things that people have ever, been, have ever found that are statistically genetically correlated with this trait. And the number one thing is dopamine D2 receptors in brain. The number one trait, this is a, an incredibly strong P less than uh, P, you know, E to the minus eight association, that mouse strains that express high levels of NAV1 have low D2 receptors, and people have also looked at their response to cocaine, and they have high cocaine response. Right? So this is the first um, discovery pathway that leads to the identification of yet another uh, major effect, novel gene associated with cocaine self-administration behavior. And it's actually very consistent with an emerging theme in addictions. Addictions appear late in life, but repeatedly raising their head on behavior genetics are neurodevelopmental genes. Apparently genes whose actions early in development program the functions of the central nervous system, create these characteristics that are present from early in life, like impulsivity, and that the addiction just happens decades down the road because that's when people help first have access to drugs and alcohol. But that in actuality, um, the roots, um, the developmental, the, the biological roots of addictions ha occur very early in life. One of the problems with all the, the studies I've told you so far is that all those, these mouse strains are genetically distinct from one another. Um, their genetic variability is, very, is still very low compared to us. Um, if you study with rats, you have even worse of a problem. The amount of genetic variability in an outbred rat line is minuscule, meaning that you have very little power to detect the genetic effect on an outcome. They just don't have, 
very much genetic variability. So it's become necessary, it's been well recognized in the field that it's necessary to um, gain access to populations in which there are greater levels of genetic and phenotypic variability so you can better map the relationships between um, DNA variation and behavior. So I'm part of a NIDA funded P50 center that involves Jackson Laboratory, UNC, University of Pittsburgh, in which we're taking advantage of a mouse intercross that involves eight ancestral lines, three of which are wild derived, in which the resulting population that comes from the intercross um, carries about 95% of all the genetic variability present in the mouse species, and their levels of heterozygosity are roughly three times greater than the human species is. So they're more genetically variable than we are, um, which gives a greater opportunity to find relationships between um, genetic pathways and behavior. So the conclusions are that inhibitory control is an endophenotype for understanding susceptibility for drug self-administration. I didn't talk about this. This is another effort I'm involved in now. Um, I'm also looking at the degree to which inhibitory control doesn't just predict how much drugs individuals take, but how the degree and the quality of neuroadaptation caused by the drug once it begins, um, all in the service of capturing behavioral control. Dopamine D2-like receptor signaling systems and phasic dopamine release onto these receptors contribute, but that way upstream of dopamine and D2 receptors are increasingly genes regulating developmental processes gestation, you know, in the early prenatal, early postnatal period that appear to be setting the stage early in development for phenotypes that won't occur from, you know, potentially, well, in the mouse's life, weeks, but years and years, years later, which further underscores what I believe is one of the most critical take-home messages um, for the addiction field, which is addiction as a root, is a disease whose roots are early in development. So I'll just acknowledge my, the grad students in my lab, uh, grad students and postdocs in my lab who did this work, Stephanie Groman, who did the non-human primate work, Rick Laughlin, who did um, the genome-wide association and linkage studies, um, Catalina Cervantes, who did the self-administration studies, um, my collaborator, Edie London at UCLA, with whom I do the uh, animal-human um, translation studies and addiction studies, and the Waletsky family, um, who has supported the research, my research and that of a number of, of other addiction researchers. Um, Jeremy lost his son um, to addictions a number of years ago and turned tragedy um, into you know, inspiration, and he founded an award that goes to addiction neuroscientists because he believes science is the cure, um, is the solution uh, for addictions, and so he's invested heavily in that, and he's been such a positive influence, I think, in the addictions neuroscience community, so I'd like to acknowledge his participation. Thank you. Yes. Um, very nice. Thank you. I have two questions. So first is, um, so is your map one phenotype homozygous in your animals? It is by definite. They're all inbred strains, so they, they're homozygous for one allele or the other. It's correct. We don't, uh, you'd, you could make F1 intercrosses and things like that to see but that's not what the population is right now. So my, my question is that, so, <clears throat> so if you have, um, if you generate a, an animal, right, where you, you introduce the mutation in that one and express it, would you make it, I mean, it seems like an obvious experiment, but would you make it cocaine addict? So the, addict in some way? Well, I mean, have you, have you done the reverse experiment to prove that? Yeah, well, we are doing the experiment now. Um, so we just, we, we, um, there's a number of steps that are involved in that. First, um, we've created with, with Gary's lab, we've created a NAV1 null, which we're currently phenotyping. But we're also putting the black 6 allele into the 129 background and the 129 allele into the uh, black 6 background to test that hypothesis. Um, and so that's work that just got funded in last summer. And so we're involved in that now. But that, that's obviously a logical question. Uh, making the null is easy. Doing the editing of the allele is not, it's not trivial, but that is what we're currently doing. Yes. It's a reasonable question. My second quick question. Um, why not epigenetics on this? I mean, it sounds, I mean, you know, I'm not a neurobiologist in any way, but this relationship with behavior sounds to me more like a looking at epigenetics markers within those regions that, than looking at particularly a gene expression at the level that you have done. Yes. Um, is there any rationale for not considering that option, or is just? Uh, the rationale, because 
you know, I want to sleep sometime, I guess, is one rationale for doing that. Um, I don't think that they're, they're not mutually exclusive, right? And so we have to understand one well, as opposed to trying to understand a lot of things at a, at a lesser level. So I agree with you that there's two reasons there could be a relationship. First is that um, genetic variation probably ch itself determines the degree of epigenetic change. I have no, I don't doubt at all that DNA variation is the template upon which you can get an epigenetic effect. Um, but that even in, in the absence of um, an explicit SNP marker, you can have differential methylation or different ac uh, activational or inhibition of a, a histone mark as a function of genetic liability. It's a gene environment interaction. Um, those are all reasonable things to do. But I think if you don't understand gene first as a main effect, uh, it becomes very difficult to look at and to understand an interaction. And I think people are doing really elegant work in the environment area and in the gene area, and that both those things later come together um, to do a more rigorous um, gene environment interaction. These studies, are, as, you, as I alluded to repeatedly, but is an understatement, are technically extremely challenging. Um, I have bare minimum power to detect, um, say, three or four genes acting additively. I have, I have no degrees of freedom for an interaction at this point. I need not hundreds, I need many, many hundreds or thousands of subjects. And so that's currently a limitation. I would say that these inbred panels are, are basically the ideal panel for looking at gene environment interactions um, because you can expose one genotype to absent versus present. And so they're actually the optimal method for doing this. Um, but that's, yeah. Or not even, maybe another one down the road. But, but it, I mean, it's a good point. It, and it's where the science is going. But I don't think that any of our endeavors human, mouse, whatever, are really yet technically yet ready to, to, to answer that big question. Never for, don't, epistasis, right? I mean, we, the, all these models are assuming additive effects of gene. We have no power to detect gene-gene interactions yet. But that's something that, you know, could do with large enough sample size, you could ask even in the populations we have now. Motivational urgency. Yeah. So, how do those results uh, related to the nature of the stimulus? For example, uh, you know, if you have like a really strong drug and what would be the effect of that compared to like less strong or more? So, let's acknowledge that from, I mean, that we, we start with um, indic uh, trying to measure both uh, outcomes, the motivational urgency. Um, and the ability to inhibit um, approach to the same endpoint measure, which is how much of it, the stuff you take, right? How much you take is a function of both factors. There really is no clear method for separating them. Um, one possible exception is the one I told you only in passing, which is that um, you, rather than uh, measuring uh, the, re the reinforcing or stimulus, of, stimulus effects of, of a drug through um, behavior, you ask people, right? You give, you give them tests of impulsivity, and then you give them a dose of the drug, and you say, scale of 1 to 100, tell me how much you'd like to do this again. And there is an association there, um, meaning that um, people tell you the subjective effects are greater when they're more impulsive. Okay, that would sign to support the idea that it's more about the, the subjective effects, the, the motivational process. Um, there are weaknesses there. Um, people are notoriously, have notoriously difficult times accurately reporting their subjective states, particularly when they're encountering a drug of abuse, which is altering neurocognitive and psychological processes. Um, and so I think we have to have a, a little bit of a caution about that note. I would say this. Um, I play them off one another. What did we, what did we evolve an inhibi inhibition system to do? To inhibit reward. These are like co-designed systems. I don't view them as being totally separate things. We, we only developed an inhibitory system because we have a reward system which guides us to things and sometimes we need to be able to stop. So I don't think, I actually never think about inhibition outside of the context of motivational urgency. Um, at the same time, I think it's important to think about motivational urgency in the context of inhibition. 
um, just about everybody here could be doing something better right now than the, what they're doing actually. Um, there's lots more pleasure in the world to be obtained than can be obtained in this room. But something else led you here. Right? So I don't think you can understand reward except in light of this process. So I, I, I consider them to be in some way so intermingled that it's an artificial dissociation. But I set it up just to kind of conceptually orient you to these two component ways of looking at our decision making processes, the, you know, the approach component, the stop component, but I don't think it's actually really all that easy to separate them. Because that's not what our brain was designed to do. It was designed to put them together. Yes? So you had a, a slide, and I believe it was from an office study, probably a domestic study, one where they were showing the relationship between opioid use and drug seeking behavior and fear and dopamine. Yep. Yeah, it's actually, yes. And do you think that because they're not separating out for shell, or do you think that something else would be good? Or I think it's not nucleus accumbens. Yeah. Um, I would say that the human studies, the non-human primate studies, um, and to some extent our rodent study, our, our mouse studies, there's one exception, which is the, a rat study of a similar type, um, associate D2 receptors in dorsal striatum, but explicitly not in ventral striatum with this phenotype. Um, and so I'm pretty convinced that it's not just an error thing. It's really that the dorsal striatum and probably the dorsal medial striatum, which is the dorsal medial part of the striatum, is really the orbitofrontal input zone, not the accumbens. And so that combined with the fact that we repeatedly find it in dorsal striatum and the fact that that's the orbitofrontal cortex um, uh, efferent zone suggests that it's really more caudate, what well, we would call in humans caudate nucleus, associative striatum. Um, so I'm not sure why that, that relationship just biologically is more true than the ventral striatum. As I said, there is a paper that showed impulsivity in rats is associated with D2 receptors in the ventral striatum in the accumbens. But there's only one such demonstration. And so um, uh, I don't have any clear mechanistic insights other than that, although it leads me to conclude that our, our inhibitory control circuit really is orbitofrontal dorsal medial striatum. And then, you know, of course, nucleus accumbens communicates with dorsal medial stridums through Haber's you know, uh, loops, um, VT, you know, substantia nigra uh, uh, stridum loops. So they're not, not talking to one another, but that, that seems to be where the effect is strong, is in dorsal medial stridum. And in, my, in our monkey studies, it follows the, actually pr the perfect topography, because it isn't just that orbital frontal cortex projects the dorsal medial stridum. It also has a band through the putamen. You see exactly that, <laughs> that band from you know, caudate nucleus and this little taper into the putamen. So I think that's, it's, it's, that's where the zone is. Yeah. I just want to say how, what an amazing undertaking it is to do that many strains of mice. <laughs> so for anyone else who doesn't believe it doesn't work with mice, that is a fantastic, fantastic study. There's such a wealth of information. Um, <laughs> in our lab, 20 strains is reasonable, but 21 is the line too far. Right. <laughs> Duly noted. <laughs> the question that I had is, all of this was done, uh, as far as I can tell, in drugs that are stimulants, so kind of directly yes. work on the dopamine system. But yes. I wonder if you can comment on how you think this might extend to drugs that are abused, but might work more indirectly, like opioids or alcohol. So um, I, 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 I don't know the, the actual data that um, reflects your answer, but I'm going to tell you what I think. Um, Human gene genetic epidemiology is pretty clear, right? So in twin studies, twin studies have been utilized. Twin studies are somewhat like ours because monozygotic twins are like our inbred strains. Um, uh, twin studies are, uh, have strongly supported the idea that there's a single additive genetic factor explaining risk irrespective of drug of abuse. Um, that substance use behavior in one twin predicts substance use behavior in the other, but the drug of choice end quotes, um, is not correlated, that there's a single genetic risk factor that manifests itself in opiate abuse in one person, dr drinking in another, smoking in another. That's, of course, completely consistent with the fact that polysubstance abuse is the rule, not the exception, which is what you'd expect if there was one gene controlling um, self-administration of all drugs. So I believe this is not a cocaine-specific thing. Cocaine is just a window into this underlying 
um, risk for substances of abuse, and that substance-specific genetic factors are very rare, right? So unfortunately, the ones we know, the genetic effects on substance use we know about are substance use specific. They're nicotinic receptor genes for nicotine, and they're um, basically alcohol, acetaldehyde dehydrogenase for alcohol, alcohol dehydrogenase. Um, the fact that they're known doesn't mean that they're the players. The big players are this single um, additive genetic factor that seems to underlie vulnerability for all of them. So I suspect that if I did the same study with, opiate, with opiates or with nicotine, I'd find virtually the same thing. It's an empirical question, but that's my guess. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> OK, one more question. Well, I'm not going to be able to answer the question as you answered it, but isn't that the art? You're supposed to answer the question you want, not the question that you're asked. Um, I could have a job in politics. Um, so the relationship between self, uh, the science of self-control um, is, is much older than the science of self-control and addictions. There's 40 years of research linking individual differences in self-control capacity to eating behaviors and to healthy versus disordered eating behaviors and to body mass index and to morbid obesity. And dopamine T D2 receptors are, every other paper in that literature is about D2. Um, and it's all in the predicted direction. People with poor self-control have variation in the D2 receptor that gives low expression of the D2 receptor and that those people have higher body mass index, they tend to have um, uh, higher body mass indexes associated with specifically overeating behaviors, not necessarily due to sedentary or metabolic issues. So I mean, that's not like radically outside of the addictions field, but it does show that this relationship holds for things other than drug and alcohol abuse behaviors. Um, and I suppose it will likely extend to other things. We know that there are reciprocal interactions um, between D2 receptors, dopamine and D2 receptors, and social behavior. Don't recipro by reciprocal, I mean that variation in D2 receptors can all are associated with differences in social motivation, social approach behaviors, and social repertoire and social experience alters D2 receptors. That's the reciprocal interrelationship. Of course, uh, so mo many forms of social behavior are themselves reward seeking, reward approach um, behaviors. So I think that, that um, this set of relationships is more generally true than not, um, including in a repertoire of behaviors that were subject to natural selection, which addictions were not. Thank you.